hi, I'm Crystal Phil from Beyond Thank You. I'm super honored to have Mark Goldstein here today, who is a clinical psychiatrist, worked at UCLA for multiple years, was a former FBI and police hostage negotiator, and is the author of multiple extraordinary books, Talking to Crazy, How to Deal with Irrational and Possible People in Your Life, Get Out of Your Own Way, Real Influence, Just Listen, The Secret to Getting Through to Absolute Anyone, which has been translated, I thought 14, but actually 24 different languages and also a book on post-traumatic stress for dummies. And um, I have known Mark since uh, 2012. You have been a mentor of mine for about the last eight years. And so yeah. when this crisis kicked in, and I realized that a lot of the people that I work with are in healthcare, are nurses, are nurse managers, who are really just reaching out and struggling, saying, how do I deal with this myself? How do I deal with my coworkers who are normally overworked and burned out, but are facing even higher level of burnout right now and aren't getting a break. And then they're also scared to go home and bring this, uh, bring the disease home to their family. And so I wanted to reach out to you to be able to kind of ask, what are your tips for those folks working in healthcare in leadership supporting their staff and are trying to take care of themselves during this time? What can folks do for themselves to take care of their mental well-being and the mental well-being of their coworkers during this time of crisis? So let me give you a sense of what PTSD is from the inside out when you're experiencing it. Right. So PTSD is you hit a trauma that's a major trauma. Mm -hmm. And if you're duty bound, which healthcare workers are, mm -hmm. you have to suppress your feelings in the moment because you got to survive, you got to help other people. And, and I use the parallel of a computer that, that suppressing your feelings is like RAM on a computer. It's your working memory. It's, this, it's what gets things done, mm -hmm. but it's exhausting to suppress and suppress and suppress. Yeah. And then what happens is if you suppress it long enough, like on a computer, we have working memory. We also have a hard disk where stuff just goes in, in mm -hmm. your computer. And so we have, in our minds, we go from suppressing to repressing. And repressing means we take it from our conscious mind into our unconscious mind because we just can't handle it. There's just too much. And, uh, and it's okay uh, when it's out of our conscious mind because then we don't have to really feel it and think it. But our repressed feelings become symptoms, mm -hmm. such as overeating, sleeping, withdrawing, uh, uh, Oh, uh, compulsive behaviors mm -hmm. and they're all driven by these repressed feelings and we often don't make the connection between the repressed feelings and the overeating well sometimes we do because we know that the eating makes us feel less anxious and we got to get something in our mouth mm -hmm. uh, and so then i think that informs what needs to happen yeah and as i mentioned to chris someone i'm getting to know well and i recommend her book to you if you're if you're a healthcare worker there's a book by Diana Handel called Responsible, a memoir. And she was the CEO of a hospital when one of their beloved employees came in and killed his two bosses on the premises and then killed himself. And she remained the CEO for another six years until she felt the hospital was on good footing. And then she admitted, you know, I'm, they deserve a fuller, CEO than me and they're doing well uh, and looks like I have PTSD and then she went out and got that treated and now she consults to organizations going through trauma mm -hmm. so you might want to look her up if you're listening Great. to this. I'll, I'll include she, a link in the below in the video to, to that book that you mentioned. Yeah. And so uh, uh, but I think reading that book will help because you realize that you're going through a process. You'll also realize that there's a balancing act that the more you suppress feelings mm -hmm. because you can't focus on them mm -hmm. uh, and the more you repress them, the more you're going to have symptoms, which later on are going to come out and erupt into PTSD. So it's a balancing act. In fact, what she talked about is she tried to help facilitate the healthcare workers in the hospital, mm -hmm. you know, having groups where they could share things, what they went through. And, and she didn't know what she could share because she was also the CEO. So, yeah. so you have to go through that balancing act that, uh, uh, and the way we get through 
uh, and we be uh, mental health problems is by feeling feelings. Mm -hmm. you know, being emotional is not feeling feelings. Mm -hmm. Being emotional is trying to stay away from feeling feelings. And so you have to balance these things. So it is a good thing to be able to acknowledge and feel those feelings. Uh, uh, other coping mechanisms are when you're feeling out of control, do whatever you can uh, where you have a sense of control. Mm -hmm. A good friend of mine has this quote. He says, we always guard our calendars. Meaning when we have something on our calendar, we're not going to flake out. I had this time for Chris. Mm -hmm. It's on my calendar. We're talking. And what you might want to do is you take out your calendar and you calendar things that you know that when you do them, even if you don't have the energy to do them, once you get started, they make you feel better. So Mark, in this, in this situation here, right, you know, for, for example, for a lot of the healthcare workers who, who may not get a break, and if they do get a break now because they're working in a place where they're being exposed to, possibly being exposed to the virus, they can't go home to their family. Or if they go home, they have to stay quarantined uh, away from those people in their family because they're putting them at risk. So what, you know, knowing that, what can people do now if they're in this and they've got to keep on going out and they're watching, you know, more people uh, dying or they're having to be with family members who can't be with there. So given the circumstances, is there, what would your recommendations be to people who, who are in that kind of circumstances now that are kind of different than many times when people experience a trauma, the trauma happens and then they move on. But this one is ongoing because we're in a global pandemic right now. Well, um, this, uh, this may sound, oh, that's too soft, but I really yeah. mean this. Keep a journal. Mm. And in your journal, you can express anything. In your journal, you can express, what was the best thing that happened to me today? What was the worst thing? Mm. What was the thing that I thought I, I just couldn't stand another day of? Mm -hmm. But there's something about writing things down, or you can now do it digitally you know, on your computer, Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have journals. I'll show you something. One of the things that Chris knows about me uh, and people who've listened to my podcast, I dropped out of medical school twice and I finished. I think I had untreated depression. Yeah. And, when I, and when I finished medical school, mm -hmm. after six years, I started writing a journal. And I wasn't a writer. In my first journal, my first entry first thing I wrote was, I can't believe I made it through they've released the madman. <laughs> so that was in 1976. This is volume 251. Wow. I have 45,000 pages. And what's happened is uh, you write down things that you're thinking, things that you're feeling, and there's something about expressing it yeah it helps you deal with it um and they may be things that nobody wants to hear about you know hmm. and you can understand nobody wants to hear about it because you don't even want to think about it but the point is if you notice that you're starting to engage in compulsive behaviors mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and i'm not saying coming home and collapsing in your quarantine room away from your family yeah. you know is a compulsive behavior I think what it is, is you're so overwhelmed. I think that's fine to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, think, uh, I think writing your way through it helps. Something else I will mention. Mm -hmm. I recently wrote a blog called The 10 Word Remote Check-In. Yeah. And people have been using this in organizations and some people have, saying, have told me, they said, this is the best exercise we've ever done for our culture. And I'll tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. And then you can find your own way of doing it. And you might even want to see about organizing it. Now you have to get the permission of your, of your uh, hospital. And simply what it is, is when you're on a ro remote call, or maybe it's just a Zoom check-in with other healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. You know, you say hello to each other. But then in the Zoom chat, uh, each per the person leading the call says, I want each of you to think of the worst time that you had since our last call. 
and attach one of the following words to it. So here are the 10 words. Anxious, depressed, afraid, frustrated, angry, ashamed, alone, lonely, exhausted, numb. And there could be other words, but that covers a lot of them. And what happens is as, as you look into the chat box, because now when you're on these Zoom calls, which everyone's getting exhausted from, mm -hmm. one of the reasons people are getting exhausted, by the way, here's a little humor, uh, on Zoom calls is because you can't multitask. Because if they see you and they know you're looking at something else, you're rude. So yeah. you got to look at all these people, you know, whereas when you're on the phone, we all sort of multitask. It's just our way of doing it. And then when you look into the chat area, you, you see too much information. You see this article I read, so-and-so is writing things. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, if you see a listing of people's names and just a single one of those words, an interesting thing happens. So people aren't overdoing it. Mm -hmm. You're not cutting anyone short because you're giving everyone the same amount of leeway and permission. But what happens is someone who you know, was just in another department who you just thought of as a function when they write down uh, numb mm -hmm. or they write down exhausted or afraid, what happens is there's this collective feeling of we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And there's also a collective admiration for, it's amazing how we're all going through this together and we're continuing on. Mm. So, and I share this with you yeah. because one of the last things that people want to do is, you know, once they get off work, I don't want to connect. I don't want to, I just want to be left alone. Mm -hmm. but, what, uh, but what happens is when we're stressed out, uh, what what uh, counteracts stress, something in our brain called cortisol, is something called oxytocin. And oxytocin is bonding. Yeah. And there's something about high oxytocin that lowers the stress hormone, cortisol, and you feel better, you feel lighter. And there's something about listing people's names in those words. It's, a, it's like a shared catharsis without it being overblown that there is just this uh, everybody is marinated in oxytocin and you feel better. So that's something I would recommend, you know, that you can try, or you can even try that with anybody, you know, uh, outside of work, you could say, you know, you can reach out to your contacts and say, any of you really feeling somewhat stressed, distressed and want to try something to do about it. And then you just check in with each other. I love that. And I can see a group of folks in a hospital or after work, you know, because I've talked to a bunch of folks who are nurses who they can't, you know, sit, sit around and chat with each other outside. But what they're doing is they're calling each other or they're going for a walk six, seven feet apart from each other. But that ability to be able to have a conversation, acknowledge that emotion. And one other thought when you were saying that that I loved is, is I know you have, you have a movement, which I'll also create a link for uh, below, which is what made you smile today. And what I realized is that, you know, for many people, I know in a few times where I've been through a couple of traumatic things where I watch someone die in front of me or watch some people almost drown. And in the same time where it was traumatic, there were also some beautiful moments that happened at the same time. And so when you mentioned journaling, I love the idea of being able to also write down, like you said, what made me smile today? Or ask a coworker, what made you smile today? What's a moment in this really traumatic time that we're facing that was actually beautiful? You know, being able to be there with a family member while they were passing away or being able to hold the camera up so they could connect with their family, that there are beautiful memories that we also want to remember that also trigger that, that parasympathetic nervous system. But I really love that activity because I think somebody can actually use that right there in the moment. Well, it's interesting because I was on a podcast, I don't know, a week ago. Yeah. And I said, you know, um, I think it's a good exercise, but if you take it out of context, it could be seen as somewhat insensitive and and the hashtag there's a hashtag w m y s t mm -hmm. what made you smile today and this podcast host and it, it was brilliant he said he said no what you have to do is change it the hashtag w m y h t and i said what does that mean he said what made you hurt today huh so you can do either, and I, and I agree with Chris that sometimes focusing on the positive mm -hmm. uh, is fine, 
but as I said, we're, we're, we're kind, you know, we're living in a collective abscess and abscess need to be drained. You know, yeah. if you try to suture an abscess too yeah. quickly, you get septic. So you can do either of those things, but I think the expressing of things helps people feel less stressed. Also a little bit, uh, another tangent of neuroscience, mm -hmm. there is a term called affect labeling. And there's a lot of research done by Matthew Lieberman, he's at UCLA. And he says that when you accurately attach the word you're feeling to what you're feeling, mm -hmm. and that's what those 10 words are, yeah. it lowers, something called amygdala activation by a third. So many people have heard of the term amygdala hijack, which means when you get all stressed out, there's a part of your brain that literally hijacks your blood flow and throws it into your lower brain to survive away from your upper brain. And that's called an amygdala hijack. Uh, but uh, when you do this other thing it, with the oxytocin, it, it, it can... Uh, it can lift you up, and when you and when you attach the right word to what you're feeling, mm -hmm. it lowers the amygdala activation. That's amazing. So you, the fact of labeling the emotion takes you outside of the emotion. I always think of it. In, I think in some of the work I do, I label it as you go from an unconscious response to a conscious response because labeling it makes it conscious, so your brain's processing it a different way. Right, right. And 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 I need to make a distinction. Being emotional is not labeling the emotion. People who are emotional hmm. are running away from feeling things. Hmm. People who are getting emotional and they're yelling, they're not really feeling the feeling underneath it all. And what's the feeling underneath it all? I don't think I can take it anymore. I don't know that I can go back in tomorrow. Uh, Mark, can I ask you a question with that? And I just, I know we only have a few minutes left, but you know, I reached out to a couple of people knowing that I was speaking to you today and, and someone brought up a uh, uh, situation that's been happening in a lot of hospitals is you have these people who are really burnt out and they've got that, you know, compassion fatigue or, or caregiver fatigue because they've been giving and giving and giving and they're, they're, you know, their fuse is about this long and they may not be treating people the best way or they may not be doing the best healthcare practices that they could be doing. And people are witnessing this and seeing coworkers do things that they wouldn't normally do because they're in extenuating circumstances. And how do you support somebody who's in that state? And also the other people who, you know, maybe you're seeing somebody that you really respected treating people really poorly or snapping at people or not being great with patients. How do you, how do you deal with that? And how do you support that relationship with that person when you're watching them do things that are really hard to witness? Well, there's a technique that I learned from a friend of mine. A friend of mine and I were involved with a transition program for returning Marines in the uh, in 2006 to 2008 general okay. marty Steele, and he would speak to these marines and he had this technique called the five realies and he would say to them uh how are you doing marine that's why they talk to each other and they'd say well you know sir it's a little bit of a transition to go from active duty to civilian life uh, and then he'd say i understand that uh, what's really going on well, you know, my spouse and I were getting into arguments and whatnot. And he'd say, no, I understand you're getting into arguments, but what's really going on? And he would say it just knowing that he wanted to drain the abscess because then there's relief. Mm -hmm. And he said when he got to the fifth, what's really going on? They would say what their truth was. And in a number of the cases, what they'd say is, sir, I saw and did awful things. And when I close my eyes, I see it more vividly, sir, so I don't close my eyes much. Hmm. And he would say to them, if you've been a Marine in active duty, we've all seen and done awful things. And I'm giving you a direct order to put that aside because you've earned the right to have a life. That's just part of being a Marine. And so what you might do, thank you for letting indulging me, telling you the story. But what you might do is you might take someone aside and say, uh, uh, how are you doing? You know, I've noticed you either look tired or we're all tired, but you look a little bit tired. You know, how are you doing? And then they can tell you whatever it is. You could say, I understand that, but you might try the five realies. Mm. Because if, if you can stay in it and, and practice it, it may not come naturally, but if you can get to the level where they get, they look at you, 
and they say, I don't know how much longer I can keep doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, and you say, I understand. And we all feel that way. If you can get to the bottom of it, they're going to cry with relief. So if they can cry with relief, and you're not making them cry, you're letting them cry, but if they can cry with relief, it lessens the chance that they'll act out from the exhaustion becomes frustration, becomes resentment, becomes anger, becomes acting out. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something because you just brought something back for me. And so I, I came back, I was running a, a youth retreat in northern Tunisia. And we had some people swim out into the ocean. A wave came and took nine people out into the water and sucked them out where I am watching and I cannot get them back. And they just disappeared. And so I thought I was going to have nine people die in front of me. Well, luckily, just they all managed to get up onto a rock. We were able to rescue everybody. But after they had been dragged across the rocks and everybody was safe, well, to add on to it, they hit the embassy in Tunisia that day and everything like that. And that was, you know, horrific to watch and experience. And I had to get my way home. You know, I, I drank whiskey. I won't lie. I did whatever I could. I got stranded in, in Jordan. So I didn't make it back to Lebanon where I was living at the time. And I remember coming back because I had to go into a talk the next day. I remember going up to my wife. I remember going to her and said, right now, I need to cry. I need you to not say anything, not say anything afterwards, but I'm just going to cry right now. And I just bawled for about 10 minutes. And then I walked away because I had to go right into a work thing right afterwards. But the being able to be that space to be able to ask, because my wife is this huge support system for me, like what you just said right there is to be able to let that go is what allowed me to go right back to work and keep on going afterwards. And I'm saying, you know, and what I was doing was to go give a big talk that I was about to give the next day. But that being able to have that safe space to have a release with a family member, with a friend, with a coworker is what actually, it was that I'm scared to have these emotions, but I realized if I don't have these emotions right now, I'm not going to be able to show up to do what I need to do next for a group of people I was supporting. And so thank you for sharing that. So it reminded me of that and that, that need to have those people where we can let those emotions go so we can let go of that weight to be able to go back to do what we need to do and then deal with processing it all later on. That makes Absolutely. sense. Thank you for that story, Chris. Yeah. Thanks. Mark, I guess my last, my last question is for, for these managers in healthcare, for these nurse managers, for these individuals supporting each other, you know, there's going to be a point where this may come back to, to normal to some state. And I know talking to a friend of mine who's, who's over at Cornell was saying that he, they heard stats that in China, in Wuhan, where this broke out, only like one in four doctors never was able to return to work afterwards because of what they had seen, what they've experienced. There's going to be a point where this all slows down. Right. And I always know for myself, it's after the trauma happens that we start to relax, that we start to actually deal with it. What should people be looking out for for themselves as signs that they need to get help and support? And what can we be looking for with our coworkers, in, especially in the caregiving industry, where people tend to be great for caring for others, but not for caring themselves? What should they be looking for for signs? Um, what should they be doing to check in with people to be able to say, hey, you know what? here's some support, here's, here's some signs I'm seeing to check in. What are your recommendations after this slows down afterwards to support their people? Well, I think the main sign is withdrawal because what's happened is you've been overstimulated and you couldn't shut it out. Mm -hmm. And so you dealt with it, you dealt with it, you dealt mm -hmm. with it. And then when it's safe, uh, what happens is there's, there's a term that Sigmund Freud came up with called return of the repressed. And so those feelings that you suppressed and then repressed mm -hmm. will want to come out uh, because they haven't been finished because you didn't feel them because you were too busy surviving. Mm -hmm. So if you notice in yourself uh, withdrawing, uh, saying, no, I'd rather not, uh, mm -hmm. but you even feel it inside or you notice other people withdrawing, I think that's going to be the main sign. I think one of the things that will push people to get support mm -hmm. um, is uh, when you're nasty to someone you love, like I heard recently someone shared with me that he, he spanked uh, one of his kids, I think three times in the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and not abusively, he said, I haven't spanked that child that many times in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I think when you find yourself doing things 
that are out of alignment with who you believe you are. Mm. A friend of mine gave me a great definition of shame. He said, shame is when you do or fail to do things that are out of alignment with who you believe yourself to be. So when you're noticing those things, I think that's a sign to reach out for help. Yeah, and you know, one thing that I, I got present to you that you said earlier too was about the, the Marine chief or Marine leader that was speaking who by taking the time to ask people and making it okay for them to be able to share was an invitation for people to express. And I think that element of our leaders and the leaders taking time to role model say, hey, here's what I've been doing. Here's who I reached out to. You know what? The staff counselor that we have was extremely helpful. You may want to consider going there when you're ready. But I found it really useful and it made a huge difference for me. But I think that element of role modeling, the checking in, but then also role modeling the self-care and sharing, hey, this is what I'm dealing with myself and this is what this is what I had to do because I wasn't using some healthy coping strategies before. And uh, this really made a difference. Yeah, there's a, there's a technique. I believe it's in my my book, Talking to Crazy, which is not about mental illness. It's about how to deal with people that drive you a little bit crazy and how to get them to calm down. Phenomenal and, title. <laughs> and there's one thing that I talk about, it's, it's total reverse psychology. And uh, another way of saying it in a more complicated way, it's, it's where you, it's called mediated catharsis, where you give them the words to say to you. So one of the magical techniques that's in talking to crazy, and this is magical, you can use this even if you're not traumatized. <clears throat> if you're dealing with someone and they're venting or they're sullen, mm -hmm. uh, and normally those conversations escalate or the person says, leave me alone, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a technique called the FUD crud, F-U-D crud, and crud is just to make it memorable. And here's an example of mediated catharsis. And you say to someone, you know, you seem frustrated and I think you're holding back. Hmm. And they go, what? Because they're expecting to get into a mini argument. And, and, you, and most people will admit to being frustrated. Mm -hmm. You know, if you said, you seem angry, I'm not angry. And you say, you seem frustrated and I think you're holding back. And they go, oh, what? You could say, yeah, I think, you're frustrated, but you're holding back because I think you're also upset and disappointed. So can you fill me in what you're frustrated, upset, and disappointed about? And what happens is as you get them to speak out their frustration, mm -hmm. that opens them up to what you really want them to speak out is their upset. The mm -hmm. upset is the anger they have to get off. But when you get them to speak that out and you'll see them calm down, uh, what you then say, is and i'll bet you're disappointed what's that about you know you might be disappointed in me you might be disappointed in yourself mm -hmm. you might be disappointed in the situation but when you can walk people from frustration to upset to disappointment by the time you're talking about disappointment it's usually a calmer conversation yeah and then you can more reasonably come up with some sort of solutions that's amazing and i really think it's that that in general afterwards is we're facing something that people have never faced before, or at least in the sense and the time frame and the uncertainty about where it's gonna go afterwards. And I think this is a time when people need to reach out and try every different technique they can to be able to support each other and nurture relationships with each other and care for each other inside of this because we don't know where it's gonna go, but there's people that are contributing, contributing a lot right now. And I think what I keep on getting present to is that you know everyone's clapping from their windows for healthcare workers now and where we need to be clapping is now and then long after it happens to be able to reach out and give the support because I always find that the support is often needed during it to keep on pushing people on, but it's really needed afterwards when all of the cheering goes away and people really need support because they have time to sit and be with what's happened. Yeah, I hope I'm, look, I hope I'm wrong. And, and again, I'm a psychiatrist, so maybe this is an overreach, but you know, I've heard from a number of people that the post-pandemic PTSD is going to be much worse than the pandemic. Yeah. You know, and because what's going to happen is there's just been so much, uh, and, and there's the, this trifecta that I call horror, terror, panic. Mm. And that's what you shut down. You know, when you're in the midst of this tr 
awful things, yeah. you see horror, mm -hmm. you suppress it because if you don't, you start to feel terror. If mm -hmm. you start to feel terror, uh, you start to get panicky and you can't function. So you're pushing that down, down, down. Yeah. Uh, and then what happens is sometimes you, in order to survive, you're just numb, but you're just numb as a way to survive. And then as you say, when it's safe and it comes up, as you say, a lot of people will say, I, I, I just can't go back. I can't go back. Yeah. And so what do you, when you say, you know, you work with a lot of companies, you work with a lot of major brands around the world and kind of, you know, I want to honor your time here, but just to kind of wrap up, this is, is what are your recommendations for the, for the leaders of organizations who are going to have employees? Because this is not just healthcare workers. You know, this is workers across every different field who, you know, there's, there's something, there's a fear to step outside of the house. There's a fear to go back into that workplace. So how do people support people in that? And, and if you are guiding, and I'm sure you're doing this in your work, if you're guiding CEOs, if you're guiding HR leaders and managers, a lot of employees, what are your recommendations of, of kind of like any tips you'd give on how do they help support that transition and support their people who are all gonna be going through this and they're going through it themselves? Well, there's a saying I have, uh, it's in my book, Just Listen. Um, often it's less important what you tell other people than what you enable them to tell you that relieves them. So yes, it's helpful. Uh, people, uh, and I'm a great fan of Governor Cuomo because he says it the way it is. He's starting to show empathy more than he's ever shown. And so you really feel this is a great leader. And so you you, you feel that strength and clarity and honesty. Uh, but I think what I would do as a leader is I would, I would try to form subgroups where people check in with each other. And, and by the way, I didn't finish the, the 10 word remote check-in. Uh, what some organizations are doing is that when certain people pick a certain word, so there were 10 words I had mentioned, and if at your worst, your word was angry or your word was numb, mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're encouraging people who at their worst feel the same word. So you get the group that are dealing with it by getting numb, the people that are dealing with it by getting angry. Uh, maybe the group that's doing compulsive stuff. But the point is you want to get people who can resonate with each other because again, when people resonate and they feel less alone in it, you get this surge of bondedness and the, uh, you know, and the stress goes down. It makes it more manageable. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would do as a leader is I would try to educate people that, you know, we're all going through this and at our worst, we feel these things. And if there's a way to check in with people who have similar worst experiences, you know, just like an AA, you know, those are alcoholics and then overeaters anonymous, those are overeaters. Mm -hmm. So if I was a leader, I would make a, I would make a statement. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want anyone uh, in our company to feel all alone in incredible distress. And so what I need to know, and you can go through your HR director, what, uh, what we need to know is when you're feeling that, that greatest distress, yeah. kind of what goes through you? What do you feel? What do you do? Because we want to put you together to support each other mm -hmm. through it. Because otherwise, what's going to happen is people are going to isolate. And when they isolate and they're doing those things, isolation makes it much worse. Yeah. And so that element of, of creating a conversation, creating a dialogue, as if we were dealing with any sort of change within an organization, now we have this universal change. And, and I, what I've been saying to a lot of people is that right now, there is, though it's horrible, the silver lining is that there's a shared experience. Everybody's circumstances that they're dealing with at home are different, but there's a shared experience that everyone around the world is feeling at the same time, which is also an opportunity for people to connect in a way that they've never connected before. And I guess what, what I hear from you is that as leaders, as HR leaders, as nursing managers, as managers of hospitals, healthcare, wherever you are, even in families, that opportunity to be able to talk about what we're going through, share what we're going through, and create that conversation out loud is an opportunity to connect and also support people throughout this whole process. You know, and what would be helpful, but it's not going to happen, is to have <laughs> leaders connect with each other. Well, there, look, there are groups like uh, YPO, Vistage, Vistage and yeah. 
And, uh, you know, so if you're in any of those group, groups and they do have these confidential places, you mm -hmm. know, where you can check with other leaders because it's, it's, it is lonely at the top and there's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. on you. I'm getting busy because there's a number of leaders who it's just too private. Yeah. And so, so we're talking because uh, I guess people open up to me. Uh, yeah. Because I, I, I can often sense what's going on and they sense that I sense what's going on. And so yeah. they just spill the beans. Well, and I think that I think one of the things and this is, I think, why you're so successful and such a gift to everybody is that you are a space where things aren't made wrong. And I think that's a, that's a huge gift is there is not something inappropriate to share because there's always space on the other side to hear it and to hear the intention behind it. And I think that that's that that rare skill that that so few people have is to be able to listen to people from the space of not adding anything to it, not making it wrong. And I think that's a skill set that people really need right now to make it safe for other people instead of trying to respond and fix to just be with the person, to be able to listen to them so that they can let go whatever they need to let go to be able to deal with and have the support to be able to deal with whatever they're dealing with in their life right now. So yeah, I was, re I was recently speaking to a CEO who's been snapping at people and um, and I said to him, I said, I know a secret about you that other people don't know. And I don't even know if you know. The secret is that you're a good guy and you don't wake up in the morning thinking to yourself, who can I hurt today? Hmm. In fact, the last thing you ever want to do is hurt or frighten people. You just do. And he just started crying because, you know, down deep, it is the last thing he would want to do. He doesn't want to hurt anyone. He doesn't want to frighten anyone. But because of his own tension, when he gets triggered, uh, he feels cornered. He feels fearful. And then he snaps. And then that lousy behavior comes out. And then afterwards, of course, he feels ashamed or he starts drinking or whatever. But uh, we all need someone to open up to who won't judge us. And I think, I think that really goes back to the question I asked you, you know, earlier on uh, in the conversation today was that when we see that behavior right now, right, there's people who may not react that way because they have coping mechanisms, they have support system, they can go home and get a hug at home. And now they can't for many people and those support systems and those structures that help them keep their sanity and keep their character during the day may be gone. Right. And so to have that care to see that, and I, I love how you saw through the the behavior to see the intention and the care behind it because everyone's trying to do their best I, someone said that to me one time i love it is everybody's trying to do the best with what they have and and how they know how to do it right now and i think that that care and that empathy is what makes a huge difference for everybody right now uh, something else i'd add uh uh geez, i can't remember it um i think it was but my son will sometimes share these auditions on like everyone's got talent or something and and there are some things that you can watch on the internet where that are so incredibly moving or touching that when you see you know the the amazing susan boyle you know who you think yeah. is going to make a fool out of themselves and they just take your heart away i think watching those things can also help you know, us feel again, because a lot of times just being so numb, we don't feel anything makes it worse. It's funny because whenever I'm burned out, one of my jokes is because I, I run a workshop on resilience and, and burnout. And I go, one of my things, my signs that I'm burning out is I'm watching a lot of Britain's Got Talent. And maybe that's the reason why. And I think that, you know, that thought that just came up is that there's so much positive going out and, and care and dear heroes and messages that people are sending to support those caregivers that that may be a great resource that healthcare uh, folks can put together is, hey, here's all the positive stories. So when you leave the office, go to this file right here and here's all the cards that have come in. Here's all the positive messages. Here's the films of people um, cheering from their windows to support you, our caregivers, so that you're putting that into your brain as well to counterbalance everything that you may have seen and experienced throughout the day. Absolutely. Uh -huh. And also don't judge yourself for negative feelings. Right. You know, uh, something that has freed me recently in the last year, I've been doing this thing called shadow work. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
what shadow work means is all of us have a dark part of our personality that has traits that we don't want to own up to because they embarrass us, make us feel guilty, make us feel ashamed. Mm -hmm. But everybody has them. And so what I've discovered is if you can acknowledge those parts of you, yeah. like people wouldn't see this about me and I'm not even consciously aware of it, but that's part of my shadow. But you know, in my shadow, I hold grudges. I'm petty. I'm a scorekeeper. I got all this crap. And the point is, uh, it takes a lot of energy to suppress that out of your awareness because you don't want to feel ashamed and you don't want other people to see that. But when you can realize that everybody has those things and just acknowledge them and it doesn't make you a bad person, it's, a, it's amazing how freeing it can be to just be aware of the dark sides of your personality and just be accepting of them. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And there's a whole lot of freedom just being able to say, hey, it's okay to feel worried. It's okay to be pissed off. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be upset. You know, the other night I had to tell my wife, I said, you know what? I know we're going to be watching the same thing, but I'm going to go sit downstairs because I just need to not talk to anybody today because that's what I need. And I think that being able to not make it wrong, to be able to talk about and ask for what we need when we need it, I think right now is a perfect time to practice some of those things that we may have needed to be trying all this time, but we haven't been doing. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to be able to speak today, um, for everything you contributed and shared and, and the, the support that you give out to people before this crisis and now the gift you are to everybody during this crisis. So thank you very much for taking the time to speak today and for your ongoing mentorship and support of me and, uh, and all the great conversation we've had over the years. I'll tell you, it's a gift to be able to realize what you were born to do and meant to do, and then you get to live it. So I feel Beautiful. very fortunate in that. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Mark. And like I said, I will leave a, down in the notes for this, uh, this video. I'll leave all the links to Mark's books, to his amazing podcast, uh, uh, wake, My Wake Up Call. My wake right? my, not a wake up call, My Wake Up Call, uh, which is extraordinary. He's got Larry King on there, Ken Blanchard, and some amazing Stephen Covey Jr. is on there. Stephen Covey Jr., is that right? And some another extraordinary calls that people having wake up calls and you can see what my conversation was with Mark. So make sure you follow his podcast as well. Thank you very much, Mark. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to talking soon.